Hello, Bill Momino here with Bill's War Game World, and we're in Morgantown, West Virginia. And oh my God, it's Goober the Traveling Bear. And Goober is in Morgantown, West Virginia, and we're about to enter the Morgantown History Museum, uh, which also, this is the hometown of none other than Don Knotts of Mayberry, Barney Fife. So we're gonna hit the museum, and I hope some of you will enjoy this video, and let's see what happens inside. All right, we are in the Morgantown, West Virginia Museum, and we're getting ready to get a special tour. Oh my goodness, it's Goober the Traveling Bear, and it looks like he's placing some donation money into the donation bin to help the museum. And as you know, you can always look at the description of the video later if you'd like to send them a donation. But Miss Patricia is here, and she's been kind enough to say she'll walk around the museum a little bit with us. And I put Goober in here, in his Scoots carrying bag. There we go. All right, and I did not bring my big microphone, so hopefully we'll be good. Um, so the, this is the beginning of the museum, correct? Mm -hmm. And you were explaining to me the Native Americans um, were hunter-gatherers in this region. Mm -hmm from 1000 to about 1690. And uh, on a local farm, evidence of a village was found and they let archeologists study it, although it's not public. But one of the really amazing things they found were petroglyphs on flat stone. All right. You know, this is a stylized animal form. And if you look down here, this is a drawing of all the petroglyphs on the farm. Quite a few. Yeah, uh, and they say these are animal f footprints, you know, I mean, made to resemble deer footprints. And here's a big cat. And, you know, um, people in that situation who were hunter gatherers that were very grateful to animals and they wanted to honor and show their gratitude to, to promote a good relationship with the animals. And that's what, what, what this carving is about. Okay. One of their interesting technologies was that they figured out that if they crushed up freshwater shells, we have some here, and kneaded them into the clay when they made pottery, it made the pottery tougher. It gave it kind of a tooth inside. All right. They tempered it, as they say. You have a lot here to see. And of course, my videos are little snippets. I can't cover everything. No. But it's so nice because this brings awareness to other visitors that might be in town. Now, near here is the place where the original Mason-Dixon survey ended. Okay. And this painting was done by a local art teacher to help us imagine their survey party. Very nice. and. Uh, they had a, a group of Native Americans with them, and they refused to go any further than core West Virginia. So that's where the survey ended. Okay. It, lots of people tried to survey from the, the ocean out this far west, but because of the mountains and the huge trees and the swamps, they couldn't get the, the line right. But Mason and Dixon were astronomers as well as surveyors, so they used the stars to true their lines. Well, look at this room. It is now. My wife and I watch one or two episodes of Andy Griffith every night because we live in Baltimore and uh -huh. we need to get a, our minds away from the city. And so we know what this is. And Opie <laughs> learned about it just the other day. Oh, but no. my my viewers may not know what this is. What is this? This is a, a, a still. It's for distilling grain into whiskey. Into whiskey. Yes. Uh, Lots of different kinds of grain were grown here in the frontier days, but rye grew really well in a damper climate. And so rye whiskey was a very big business out here. And that's why you had the Whiskey Rebellion, you know, that this was not a small deal. This was a big deal. And you can see here a, a flat boat full of whiskey going toward Pittsburgh. All right. Well, there we have a, a, a still in... Um, is it Mr. Vincent who's in charge of the museum here? He doesn't fire that up once in a while for the holidays, <laughs> does he? <laughs> Not while we're here. <laughs> no. <laughs> Possibly on the weekends. Well, what other highlights do you have to show me here? That are, uh, 
Boy, you have so much in here. It's quite amazing. Well, you know, um, after Virginia seceded from the Union, West Virginia, uh, this part of Virginia asked to be taken back as a restored government of Virginia. And here we have a picture of a young man who volunteered for the Union Army with his twin. They would have been like 13 or, or 14. And they put, they were fifers. They played the fife. And okay. Somebody else played the drum when the soldiers marched. Well, now, what are all these bottles? They look like they're medicinal. Um, oh, they are. These are old... Um, Patent medicines, in the sense, medicines are not not prescribed by a doctor specifically. Wow. And this is an old general store, uh -huh. uh, Jerusalem Mills, um, out in Baltimore. I've done a few videos for them, and they have a re they, their general store closed in 1906, and they still have a lot of the stuff still in it for the museum. It's oh how great! And it looks like the, just like that. Well, the, you know the. Um, the School of Pharmacy at WVU has a museum, and we inherited some of theirs because um, the hospital system is always changing shape, and they lost some space, and that was our gain. Wonderful, just wonderful. This is actually um, a tape dispenser for labels for a pharmacist who makes his own medicine, makes his own pills, and they used to do that. Well, it looks like you have some printing presses here. Yes, this is a, a, a display about old-fashioned styles of, 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 of hand typesetting and printing. One of our board members was a printer, and uh, eventually, you know, they were out of business because people can now do things on their computers. But interestingly, um, the first time he found out about that, one of his customers said, I want you to do a certain thing, but I, I want to do the rest on my computer. So uh, Swifty went to that person's business and, and found out about it. And this is a very old Apple. The first print shop in, in, in Morgantown to have wow. a computer. They ha and look at that, they're sure different now, aren't they? Yes, they are. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody was asking me the other day, is that real? And I said, I'll tell you, it definitely is. I, I love this timeline of printing uh, board you have back here. It's quite impressive. And we also, um, we, Swifty gathered a lot of plates from the old printing companies, and he just prints them up for fun. Here's one of a mail pouch barn, which is a, a major kind of folk uh -huh. thing in Ohio, I know, and some in West Virginia. Block Brothers Tobacco in Wheeling made hand-rolled stogies but they were the first to uh, give a name to their scrap, which was mail pouch chewing mail tobacco. Pouch. Yeah, and they also were the first to get the idea to say, I'll paint your bar, and if you let me paint a mail pouch, pouch sign. Well, that's a great piece of history. Mm -hmm. And Here we have a section on coal mining, because coal mining has historically been a huge industry here. Now this, is the canary in the coal mine. And if they die, it means there's gas in the mine. Is that right. correct, ma'am? Right, and, and actually many times um, they just pass out easily and you can grab them and go and head for a hallway, sort of, that will have better air. Okay. Because they can smell carbon monoxide and that kind of thing, and people can't, but people will die from it. Okay. Because when you cut into rock, you release gas. And, you know, if, if you're outside, that's okay, but if you're in the mine, that's not okay. Now, I have a lot of viewers, because my channel primarily hits a lot of military stuff. This looks like a World War I exhibit. Yes, it is. And here are some local, handsome local men in their uniforms. And here are a whole lot of local men waiting to, um, they're draftees, and they're waiting to, to go. Okay, right from Morgantown, September uh -huh. 20th, 1919, is that right, or 17? 17. 17. 17, yep. All right, well, continue on uh, where, where you and think here, I should hit. We, um, the, the Mon River, which, you know, has been deepened over time, um, 
had stern wheelers running on it. And here are a couple of them that are racing. Okay. It looks pretty wild. You know, the people <laughs> a lot of people on yeah, it. Yeah, they look like it's perfectly normal, but they're like running into each other at the uh, finish line. Now this is one of my great idols of my, you know, we're Don Knotts. Um, watch many YouTube channels and we watch Mayberry at least one or two episodes a night. Um, so, do you know anyone that was related to him here when he no, grew um, up? Nobody, uh, well, I do. I know some of his best friends. Um, Neva and, um, Neva Feck and her husband Don ran around with Don Knotts. They all lived in the Seneca neighborhood, which is named for the Seneca glass plant. And his mother ran a boarding house there, and she kept glass workers and college students. Okay. So he had a changing audience. And uh, she definitely knew he would be a good actor, so she backed him all the way. Well, we just watched Ghost of Mr. Chicken just the other day. Uh -huh. And uh, so it, it's a high priority for us to visit the, uh, the Don Knotts uh, memorabilia that you have here. And, you know, he, he grew up without much money, but he really knew how to have fun. Um, he wanted to be a ventriloquist as a teenager. Yes. So he can make money at parties. And, and we, we saw on Biography Channel, he got so frustrated, he threw the, the doll overboard, the ventriloquist dummy. That's exactly true. <laughs> in, in the South Pacific, yes. Yeah. His daughter was here a few years ago, and she was telling us that. And, and a woman came in one day, and she said, my uncle ran the Metropolitan Theater in the 1930s, and it took him a long time to change the film. And Don would bring his dummy to the movie, and he would run up on stage and perform. Wow, that's just fantastic. And, and her uncle had to drag him off. <laughs> and, and, and there's the reluctant astronaut. It's <laughs> nice that you have all these... Um, I, I, what are they, the posters for the movies uh -huh. uh, that they'd have We're at the... we fortunate, fortunate to have that. So I would like to scan a little bit here at the bottom before we go on to the next cases. A wonderful Mayberry jacket there. Well, I plan on going to Mount Airy um, later this month with Goober the Traveling Bear. We're going to go visit um, Andy Griffith's whole town. Well, they... And well, you, you may very well meet Karen Knotts, his daughter. She's a librarian in California, but she's also a stand-up comedian. Oh, okay. So, all right. Well, we're moved away from the Don Knotts section, and where are we heading to next, Miss Patricia? To some gorgeous goblets, hand-cut crystal from the Seneca Glass Company. Now, is this glass company still in business? No, it isn't, unfortunately. Uh, it's, it's been out for about 20 years now. Wow. Uh, and these were, you know, blown into a mold. But then a person cut all those designs. I'm going to try to get a close up without a glare. Yeah. Boy, they cut all that in hand. Yeah, and they, they used a wheel with crushed diamonds on it. Amazing. Yeah, it definitely. Now, Morgantown was greatly enriched by the recruiting of, of talented glassmakers from all over Europe. And, and that was in 1890. So Joachim Lindquist came from Sweden and he went into the glass house and Goldstrom, his son, was the chief cutter when these were made. Okay. And his brother, Ar his brother Arnold was a blower. And these are design notebooks that, that Goldstrom kept. And also his Flint Glass Workers Union card. Very nice. And what do we have in this next display case? Well, many different Morgantown glass companies these are of special interest. They're natural, free-blown, not blown in molds. And Jackie Kennedy chose them for the White House. Which one is the... All right, see I, got, the, I see the White House yeah. logo on there. And, Very and neat. You see that, that graceful form? Uh -huh. That's, you can do that with a blowpipe. Where You can do, do this with a blowpipe and a mold. All right. And she chose those in the 60s. And... I read where a friend of hers said, Jackie liked luxury, but she loved a good deal. And she bragged to a friend that her West Virginia glass was just as beautiful as Baccarat. All right. Um, can I ask about this big house that's sitting here? Well, um, let me show you first the original house. Okay. I'm trying to get this so you can see it. Okay. This is a factory that did millwork. 
um, I mean, they made regular sized lumber, but they also made all kinds of fancy shaped wood. And see the car, you can get a sense of how big the factory is. Right. And on their roof was a full size house to, to advertise what kind of a house you could build with their stuff. And, and eventually, well, this was used for parties and business meetings, but eventually it was taken down and some of the employees built this model to remember it. Okay, very neat. And oh my gosh, Goober, you cannot go in the house. It's a museum exhibit. You gotta get back in the bag. Patricia, I'm sorry, he's being bad. Well, it's a beautiful house and I don't blame you a bit. All right, where are we heading to next after our interruption with my stuffed bear? Well, this is um, a, a, a picture and um, the photograph was taken by Lewis Hine, who was a campaigner against child labor in dangerous industries. And if you look closely, you can see the children working in the glass oh, factory. Oh yeah, way in the back there. There's a little fellow working there and one yeah. over here. Now, there's another connection there to West Virginia because Mike Owens, a glass worker in Wheeling, who was blacklisted after participating in a strike, invented a machine that could make bottles. And that's what children did mostly, is blow bottles. And so uh, uh, people in New York who were campaigning against child labor said, you know, we did everything, but Mike Owens' machine is what got the children out of the glass house. Okay. Well, where are we heading next? Along this wall or that wall over there? There's quite a bit to see here, everyone. So when you're in Morgantown, you have to visit. Okay, I'm going to pause and see. Um, you could, uh, for instance, look at, at, at this. Um, so this is a, a coal mine. Uh -huh, it's a scene of, of, of coal miners having a morning snack before they go to work. Wow. And the conditions back then and they're just horrible. I know they've vastly improved from what they used to be. Right, absolutely. But you know, there there are, are many people who take great pride in mastering those circumstances and actually, you know, like to work in the mine. I know my father was a mining engineer and that was his preferred. He said, I always felt safer underground than I did above. above. But then he was shy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to have someone ask me, if I don't ask you, what are all these books sitting there, these big, huge red books? Well, and the big, huge, um, pretty books are city records. Um, the, the top ones are police blotters, which is, is the daily journal of okay. uh, the police department, and these are tax uh, records. The city needed a place to put these, and they're so beautiful that they said, would we like them? And of course, you can read them. And one of the, the, the fun things I saw was somebody, uh, when we had gas street lights, somebody had a cigar and he was intoxicated and he wanted to light it. And he shinnied up the street light and lit his cigar in the gas light. Now, unfortunately, he broke the globe. And that was his, <laughs> that was his crime. Uh, okay, and then we have what, an inner room here. We have a special exhibit on three local waterways, the Monongahela River, the Cheat River, and Decker's Creek, which is just a few blocks away from the museum. And so is the Long River. And it's kind of an environmental history because it starts with how things were when Europeans came. Okay. And here are some animals. And you'll see huge trees as you walk around. And there's a beaver hide. Yes. So did we have buffalo here? I see. Uh -huh, we did. I didn't realize they came this far east. I thought they sort of stopped out in Ohio. So I learned something today <laughs> to Morgantown, West Virginia History Museum. Um, look at the size of that tree. I'm going to move over closer. That's got to be five feet across. Oh, yeah. Um, there were so many big trees like that. Wow. And see, at the time of the Civil War, a lot of the state was not very much inhabited. 
you know, people in the mountains were few, and they were happy to be there that way. <laughs> but um, as, as the um, market for timber grew, towns were actually created in the place where the forest was. Okay. So you had a lot of people ended up living in places they hadn't before. And that also is true of coal mining, which followed because, you know, the coal was in a lot of places where people weren't living either, so the companies built houses and whole towns for the workers. Very nice. This is the Monongahela River, which I think looks like a dragon in a Chinese parade, you know? Uh, yeah, we've done many of French Indian War videos up at the uh, Braddock's Defeat region. In fact, oh. we were, we just... Goober the Traveling Bear just raised $330 last week for the Braddock Battlefield History Center. Oh, so, that's really cool. In one of his donation campaigns. A lot bad for a little stuffed animal that's 40 yeah. years old. Yeah. Now, can you tell me about this? Well, this is an iron furnace. And it's out, it's out in Cooper's Rock State Park. It used to be that where you found iron ore, and we actually had some here, um, you built your furnace uh, because tr transporting the iron ore and the wood to make the charcoal that you needed um, it was very expensive so you built it where the iron was and that's what this is this one is in Cooper's Rock State Park and it's big enough that you can walk into the opening Wow and right. it's there they, they took the, uh, the iron ore and smelted it on a pile of charcoal so that the iron ran out and left behind the rock. Well, that's uh... Now, yeah. after the railroad came, people started to look for a big flat place for a factory, like in Pittsburgh, and they shipped the materials in. Okay. And that changed, every, and that changed everything. All right, well, I guess we'll go over to your desk and you're going to let me know when the museum is open. Okay, and here's, and here's a kind of remarkable thing. Um, some Christians feel that in order to be properly baptized, you need to be totally immersed in water. So these people are being baptized in the Monongalia River. Okay. In 1909, because they have a sense that you truly feel born again when you come out of the water like that. All right, well, we're going to go over to the desk, and Miss Patricia is going to give us some information on when you can visit the museum. All right, here's Miss Patricia, and she's going to go over the museum hours and location. Our museum is open from 11 o'clock until 5 o'clock, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and 6 o'clock, or 12 o'clock to 6 o'clock on Saturday and Sunday. We're closed Monday and Tuesday. And we're located at, behind the Mon Arts Center, which is a big old building with gray stone and big pillars on High Street. And we are around the corner on Kirk Street. And we're right next to a big federal court building. And you can actually find parking behind our museum. So keep your eye open for that because parking in Morgantown is always a little difficult. All right. Well, thank you very much for allowing Goober the Traveling Bear to visit. Well, and everyone needs to come and visit your wonderful museum. And please stay safe, be kind, and be courteous, everyone. And thank you for watching another one of my videos.